I'm here with me today. I have four um, speakers, industry experts um, from Malta, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, going through this subject. Uh, Claire Farruja, Head Strategy Policy and Innovation within the MFSA, and Reza Rafa, Managing Partner, Ganado Advocates, Stephen Gauci Balucci, Managing Director, CC Funds, and Chris Manicaro, Managing Partner within RMCYs. Um, let's start with a brief introduction of yourselves, um, a company you're representing, and uh, your background. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Finance Malta and Masa, for having us part of this event. Um, Claire Farruja, Head of Strategy, Policy, Innovation at the MFSA, as most of you know, it has been mentioned earlier as well, as well the single um, regulator for financial services, Malta, and the function that I'm responsible for, it undertakes um, strategic policy work, uh, including the development of um, the strategic policy cycle um, within the MFSA and related um, regulatory development work. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Annabel, uh, for the invite. Uh, Chris Manikaro here, um, uh, Managing Director at RMC Wise. RMC Wise um, assists uh, clients setting up in, in Malta through uh, the control uh, functions, but we also have um, another company as part of our group, AQA Capital, uh, which is a USIT and uh, an hotel investment fund in, in Malta. Good morning. Um, so my name is Stephen Gaucho Palucci. I'm a managing director of CC Fund Services. Uh, CC Fund Services forms part of the Kalamata Kushkiri money base group um, in Malta, which is one of the biggest local um, uh, financial services provider on the island. I've been involved in funds for around 18 years, um, uh, both in Malta and other fund jurisdictions, um, starting off from audit, uh, fund accounting, transfer agency, um, uh, corporate services and also um, AML. Thank you. Hi good, mo Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Andres Zarafa. I'm from the law firm of Ganado Advocates. Uh, Ganado is a full-service law firm. We're around 100 lawyers. We span the whole area of commercial law uh, with a particular specialization in financial services. I am also the co-head of the asset management Investment Services Group uh, at the firm. Uh, I've been doing this more than um, uh, I'd like to, to, to think for over 20 years now. Um, uh, and over the last 20 years, I think, um, uh, well, we've seen a financial crisis or two or three. Uh, the, we saw changes in our regulatory landscape. Uh, we structured funds. We set up MIFID firms in Malta. So working with all our colleagues here, um, uh, we've been, I think, at the forefront of a, of a burgeoning um, financial service industry. Okay. So, given you're the longest in the industry, I take the opportunity because you mentioned it yourself. So, um, you've been in financial services and funds for a long time, Andre. And um, Malta, Malta, <laughs> Malta joined the EU in 2004, and since then we've we've seen an, a growth um, in financial services in general, but also specific to funds. Can you maybe take us through the detail of how this has evolved and also um, through a market and regulatory um, sides of it? Sure. Uh, um, we've already had quite a, a speech on, on Malta's <laughs> um, uh, history. So I'm going to just give you a, a minute or two on the, on the financial side. Um, without getting into too much detail. Uh, prior to 2004, not being members of the European Union, uh, we were still setting up funds. Um, we were setting up uses equivalent funds, which um, are very similar to the, uh, to the types of funds which you may be setting up in Switzerland as well. Uh, and at the time, it was uh, really the, the, uh, the, the, those were the first signs of um, a financial service industry which then grew over the years, once Malta joined the, the European Union in 2004, and then more importantly, I think, or as importantly, became a member of the Eurozone in 2008, uh, that placed Malta on the map as a fund domicile alongside the more traditional uh, fund domiciles which there were already existing in the European Union at the time, which had been around since the 1980s. Uh, so it was it was a tough nut to crack at that at that time because we had to, uh, as a smaller jurisdiction, 
and the new kid on the block who had to compete with much bigger uh, fund domiciles, much bigger fund jurisdictions. And I think from a, from a strategic perspective, the decision, the main decision which, had, which was taken uh, in around 2006 to 2010 was to allow fund operators to set up their fund in Malta without necessarily having all their service providers based in Malta. So with the administrator being based outside of Malta, the custodian as well, as well as the fund manager. Now that was only uh, at the beginning. This only happened at the beginning. First of all, because the, the AIFM directive, which came into force in 2013, then eventually required for a depository to be based in Malta in order to service the Malta fund. But more importantly and interestingly, we saw most of our clients, I would say 99%, opting for a local fund administrator uh, with a, a vast offering of fund administrators having a, an, an office in the jurisdiction where we have around today around 20 to 25 fund administrators, most of them international fund administrators. A fund uh, promoter or a, or a fund manager wanting to launch his fund in Malta was spoiled for choice. So that became part of the ecosystem and fund administration became uh, a very busy uh, a very busy area, not to mention that fund administrators then started looking outside of Malta and servicing as well non-Malta funds, uh, which was a, an interesting development of, of the last, I would say, 10 years. Moving on, the IFMD, I think, in 2013 was a uh, one of the, uh, was the directive which impacted uh, uh, Malta's fund offering most. Uh, alongside the AFMD, we had our own homegrown professional investor funds, uh, what we call with the acronym PIFs, which we still have today, and we actually revamped, and my colleagues will get into more detail on how we revamped the, the, uh, the infrastructure around, around the, the notified PIFs and the professional investor funds. And even there, we saw uh, an evolution of regulatory thinking. Uh, so until 2017, 2016, 17, we wanted to regulate and license everything. So that was the regulatory, uh, the regulatory approach. License any type of fund which is set up in, ju in the jurisdiction. From 2017 onwards, the regulator moved uh, towards more of an AFMD approach where the focus is more on the manager and less on the fund. Uh, not to, it doesn't mean that the fund would, would not be regulated in some shape or form, uh, but the licensing requirement for certain types of funds was removed. And we started off with the notified AIFs in 2018, I believe, and more recently, the same approach was adopted with some obvious changes to the notified professional investor fund. Um, and that brings us basically to the infrastructure we have today, where um, Malta has, uh, at this point, all the fund structures and fund vehicles which you will find anywhere else um, in, the, in your traditional fund domiciles without really any wrinkles which are, are not expected. You know, so, uh, be it from a structural corporate point of view, um, you could have open-ended, closed-ended funds, you could have limited partnerships, you could have CCAVs, so it's the, the, the typical offering. And from a fund perspective, from a regulatory point of view, there are the various types of notified, licensed, and regulated collective investment schemes. You referred to funds and you gave a very good overview, but maybe we touch, I, I mean, the audience surely knows about AFES, UCITS, whatever you find across Europe, but maybe um, a little bit more detail about the local structure, so namely the PIF, um, uh, notified PIF, anything that is more local. Yes, I had, well, uh, so across the European Union, uh, we have alternative investment funds. So alternative investment funds today, uh, well, since 2013, are defined in the AIFM directive. And any kind of fund which is launched in Europe is either a USIS fund or an AIF that we know. In Malta, we have a type of AIF, uh, which could be a, a type of fund which could be an AIF, but which could also be uh, falling outside completely of the AFM directive, which is the Notified Professional Investor Fund. So this is a type of fund which is only available to certain types of what we refer to as qualifying or professional investors. Um, it does not benefit from 
in a marketing passport uh, because it is not available to um, uh, under the, the auspices of the IFM directive. So it would be available to be managed by uh, either de minimis managers or managers which are based outside of the European Union. And this is the interesting thing about the notified PIF, in that the MFSA is basically allowing a Swiss manager, uh, which is regulated in, in Switzerland, it would have to be regulated in Switzerland uh, by the Swiss authorities, to manage a professional investor fund in Malta, which is notified to the regulator, so it is not subject to a license, and thus reducing time to market by, by months. So it is a product which is quick, which is nimble, and which can fit into any type of corporate or non-corporate structure, starting off from a trust to a limited partnership, as I was mentioning before. Um, it can be an open-ended company, it can be a closed-ended vehicle, whatever, um, uh, all the categories are, are available. Very good. Um, the MFSA now. So, Claire, um, we've seen how Malta has been very innovative, taken various steps, bold steps, um, to cover the industry needs. Um, can you take us through these up till to date? Andre referred to some, some um, even the notified PIV and some matters that you'll probably refer to. But from um, the authority side, can you please take us through this as well? Um, uh, sure. Um, well, with regards to the authority's efforts in this area, I mean, there's been going on practically for, for quite some time now, for um, the past few years. Um, the authority has been focusing on the area of um, funds and asset management. It has been clearly set out in the discussion paper that we had issued um, uh, with regards to the um, asset management sector. It focused <coughs> largely on, uh, on three main pillars, on uh, visiting certain existing regulatory frameworks with the aim of making them even um, more pragmatic and accessible. Um, the development of new frameworks um, uh, as well, as well um, on a more wider level, um, a greater industry outreach um, uh, and so on. So, and further to this, we had also um, as well included the sector um, in our uh, strategic statement that we had published as well last year. Um, so as an authority, we still believe that um, uh, the sector um, uh, needs to be given the, 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 the required importance um, with the intention of even seeing it growing even further. Um, uh, to understand, obviously, what the authority has been working on as well, um, it's, it's, it is also important to mention the trends that, as a regulator, we've been seeing um, over recent years. Um, Andrea has just mentioned as well um, our thoughts um, and uh, the way how we went about even um, in developing certain frameworks, and these were practically being driven by um, the need for lesser regulation, um, bearing in mind as well the, um, the setups that we see in Malta um, in, in, in the space, which are small, medium-sized operators. So the issue of costs of compliance and regulation, um, uh, obviously, so it's quite of a concern when it comes to the, these kind of operators. So there was quite a push for a lesser need to, to, to regulate. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, coupled, uh, coupled with that, um, there is always the issue of improving the timing to market, um, which is a, a crucial pushing. aspect <laughs> uh, when it comes to, to, to asset managers. Um, so essentially, um, for us, obviously, the need to ensure um, flexibility on the one hand without being um, too prescriptive um, uh, and making sure that um, uh, the risks associated with the products um, are addressed, depending obviously on the type of investors. I mean, for us, that is what we um, always keep in mind in coming up with, with new initiatives. Um, uh, in the recent years, besides the Notified Dave, which has already um, been mentioned, which is practically um, a fund structure which targets um, uh, full alternative investment fund managers, um, and which has been quite a success. Um, we moved on um, from the licensed PIF um, to develop um, the notified PIF framework. Um, again, um, uh, as part of this framework, the, the uh, practitioners can benefit from a more streamlined authorization process um, and better timing to market, um, uh, a less degree of um, regulatory 
requirements and even from a supervision point of view, um, the authority will intend to largely focus on um, only on certain aspects um, of the framework. So I wouldn't consider this to be um, a, fully fund, a fully regulated fund structure. Um, it is also important to mention, um, uh, I mean, as, 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 as a framework, obviously it targets um, professional investors. So for us, um, the concept of risk-based approach um, could be um, followed in, in, in this regard. Um, and um, so far, at least, um, uh, the, the interest has been there, and we hope to um, see more interest I mean, in, the coming, in the coming months. We have also published a frequently asked questions um, document in relation to this framework in order to even um, facilitate uh, the, the submission of, of, of the applications as well. Um, and besides, um, uh, besides notified PIF, um, we have um, also, in the past years, also um, uh, focused our approach on even coming up with um, certain structures without going into details, such as, for example, the incorporated cell structures, which offered an additional um, legal vehicle to our fund toolbox. So there were initiatives um, seeing things retrospectively that were undertaken by, by the MFSA. Um, besides that, one last point, um, uh, one important factor that the authority consistently um, aims to improve is the time to market. And um, in recent years, um, considerable improvement have been made. And we have also um, published an authorization charter with um, stipulated time commitments for the turnaround of certain applications. Um, we have also implemented certain um, enhancements in the, um, the way how we process even the fitness and properness of key individuals. Um, so we've, uh, we've been also seeing improvements being made also on that front. Very good, thank you. Steve, um, you probably get asked this question when, when um, speaking to prospective managers looking to set up in Malta. What are the key advantages? We, we heard about time to market, we heard about the local ecosystem, and we have a lot of competition when it comes to fund administration. Um, you joined the industry um, back in, in time, like myself, probably in the very beginning when many fund administrators were actually setting up. Um, how has this growth um, and success, you know, contributed to the success of, of investment funds? So basically, I need to, to know the advantages of setting up in Malta and how the local ecosystem supports this. Okay. Um, yes, I think I would like to start with mentioning the service providers. Um, in Malta, you can find a diverse pool of experience and skilled um, uh, professionals, so um, including managers and auditors, legal and, and tax advisors. So basically you can find um, uh, all the service provided ne providers needed um, uh, to set up, but also to operate and maintain um, a fund. Um, uh, we are obviously, and I think this is an evidence, evidence today, um, very eager to attract uh, new business um, to the island. And, and to prove um, our worth. Um, we are very client-focused, and uh, we have a, a culture of getting things done. Um, so um, when compared to our other jurisdictions, um, uh, we obviously um, can provide a very personalized and uh, flexible um, services to, uh, to our clients. And in many cases, um, senior management um, is always in direct contact um, with the uh, prospective uh, clients, investors, and also the fund administrators. Um, uh, and we promise a, a quick turnaround um, in relation to any issues or any teething problems a fund might, heart, uh, might, might have when, uh, when launched. And uh, we also um, believe in having um, wellness uh, meetings and discussions with our clients to make sure that, we are, uh, that our services is, is up to par. Um, um, I mean, the MFSA, um, something about the regulator, um, they are renowned for their strict um, regulatory um, uh, standards and also of their robust um, uh, supervision, but are also very proactive. Um, they are also um, uh, very determined to meet and have discussions with prospective clients and also with prospective investors and um, the turnaround from the MFSA nowadays is a couple of days. So uh, where in other jurisdictions you can uh, wait for a couple of months to have something changed in an offering supplement of a fund. In Malta, um, uh, it's a matter of weeks or even days 
uh, in some cases where um, uh, things sort of progress very, very, very fast. Um, uh, we obviously need to speak about the, the costs um, uh, when compared with other jurisdictions. Um, uh, Malta um, uh, can offer um, lower fees. Um, we can offer lower fees, for example, as fund administrators because um, we have invested a lot um, in our systems and also in our automations, but also um, uh, we have managed to make sure that we are able to um, uh, create a link with the banks, um, with the custodians, as also with the investment managers, and provide a service which is automated but um, does not compromise the level of the quality and the service we offer. So I think that is something very important. Um, uh, as Andre already um, mentioned, we are um, we have many um, structures in Malta which meet the needs of um, investors and also of the managers, um, uh, especially the new um, Notified Professional Invest Investment Fund, um, which we as fund administrators have been given the responsibility by the MFSA to act as due diligence um, service providers. Um, there we are making sure um, that the fund has a, a very solid um, corporate government structure, but also um, that all the service providers at the start, but also during the life of the fund, are, prepare, are fit and proper um, to prepare um, to, to, to offer the service to the fund. Um, as you all know, um, Malta is trying to position itself as a hub for um, a fintech, um, digital assets, and also blockchain. And obviously, any Swiss manager who is interested in uh, exploring this option um, due to the sound uh, regulatory framework we have on, on digital assets um, can use Malt as a platform um, to explore also um, these options. Very good. I want to add a little bit on, on the workforce. So um, what I noticed as well, and you'd probably confirm this, our, uh, from a service provider's perspective, our teams ranging across custodians, fund administrators, asset managers, um, I, I notice also that they tend to be, our teams tend to be more senior. So even when your investors or yourselves are dealing with um, our team members, you tend to get the answers you need, probably because they are dealing with your fund, not from A to Z, but they know it well. As, as um, Stephen said, Something even from, from a, a senior management perspective, um, we're, we're also very much close to our clients, so you wouldn't just be a number, you're, you'd be a valued customer, and our services are more tailored to what you need, so even when arriving at the fund that you need, probably we first need to understand your objectives and then work backwards to see how the local industry can, can help you. Um, one thing to mention as well, um, the big four are all present there, um, probably you're aware of it, but good to mention it because when it comes to audit options, I'm frequently asked that question as well. Thank you. So, Chris, um, when it comes to Maltese funds, we've covered that, but when it comes to actually managers, we've seen asset managers looking also to set up a base in Malta, not just the fund or maybe just the management license and then manage funds elsewhere, which is possible as well. What are the options? And maybe you go into a little bit of you know, the requirements, um, uh, especially when it comes to substance. Um, so, as, as Annabelle said, um, a number of managers do set up in Malta to manage funds uh, overseas, not only uh, Maltese quality funds. In fact, we have lately seen um, uh, a lot of managers setting up from the UK and, and Switzerland into, into Malta to actually manage um, funds overseas. In fact, AQA, although our headquarters is in, in Malta, our majority of funds is in Maltese, but uh, of course we manage like Cayman funds, BVI funds, Italian funds, Luxembourg, Irish, so everything is done um, in, um, in Malta. Now, on, on the license in front, although Andre and, and, and Claire has already touched upon it, I mean, it depends, of course, on what type of funds or strategies you want to, to manage. So if you're going for the traditional funds, this, let's say the plain vanilla asset, uh, you would opt for a use its uh, management company license. If you're going for the, let's say, exotic strategies or liquid strategies, you would go on the alternative uh, license. However, there is also, um, uh, let's say, an, another regime, which is the de minimis uh, manager, where if, if you have a fund uh, that you can manage um, below the 100 million threshold, you can opt for that um, license. Now, um, Annabelle mentioned a good point, substance. Of course, irrespective of which license you'll get, you need to show 
substance. Why? Because I mean, we do not want letterbox entities. We want our our industry to grow, to solidify, and get um, get traction. So um, we need. To, I mean. Ma let's say prospective managers who want to set up in, in Malta uh, need to have certain substance. By substance, what do we mean by, by, by this? First of all, uh, the investment decision making, so the, the, the portfolio management in relation to the to the strategy must be done in in Malta. Okay, so you you either let's say uh, the portfolio manager relocates to to Malta, and mind there are although I'm not a tax advisor and I will not go um, into detail, but um, my colleagues here from um, from different service providers can. Um, walk you through. There are also uh, advantages from a um, tax point of view if you will relocate to, to Malta. Or else, uh, what, you can, what you can do is, of course, hire qualified uh, personnel. And of course, uh, they will assist the, the main portfolio management in making the, um, the investment decision. Now, when it comes to the control functions, I mean, control functions, the risk manager, the compliance, the AML. Although you are required to have these um, when, you, when you set up, the MFSA is conscious that, listen, from day one, we cannot expect to, uh, of course, make that, that investment. So the MFSA, the regulator, would allow you to also outsource that, uh, that function. In fact, um, one of our companies, RMC, um, uh, and uh, others here in, in the room, uh, did assist, uh, let's say, fund managers in setting up in Malta by outsourcing these uh, these control functions, making individuals available um, to perform these uh, these functions. So the manager will focus on uh, what they are, let's say, best at the investment uh, management. Apart from that, of course, you need to have also um, a physical office, um, a local director, so uh, a local director which which can and also uh, some managers, um, as Andre mentioned in, in his earlier intervention, do opt for local local fund administrators and local legal advisors to assist them, let's say, um, in, um, in, their, in, in their application or in their day-to-day -day, um, operations. So, yes, I mean, we do, we have managers setting up in, in Malta to manage funds um, overseas, but of course there must be substance. Very good, thank you. Andre, we're in Zurich, so again, my favorite subject, digital assets again. Um, uh, Malta started regulating digital asset funds um, in 2018, or, or rather allowed certain type of funds to invest in digital assets. I remember the first ones being set up, but since then we now have also a fully regulated AIF in Malta, um, even sub accepting subscriptions, what we call in kind, um, so the, the, the sector has grown. Um, apart from funds, there has also been the VFA Act. So um, can we go into more detail about what Malta can offer in this space, in the digital asset space? One of the... Yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, one of the uh, strategic decisions which were taken in 2017-18 slash was for Malta to place itself out there as a jurisdiction which was welcoming um, all forms of financial technology, but going beyond that, uh, even getting into um, uh, cryptocurrencies and all other forms of digital assets and the servicing of digital assets. And in fact, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the world, certainly in the EU, um, which issued a law regulating the provisioning of services to, uh, in relation to digital assets, which we called at the time the Virtual Financial Assets Act. Now this act, when it was put together, when it was drafted, was inspired heavily by the style and the manner in which the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive regulates Finance investment services. So we had a list approach with a number of services in this VFA Act, uh, which were regulated, uh, be it brokerage in relation to digital assets, being advisory services in relation to digital assets, portfolio management services in relation to digital assets, and so on and so forth. A whole list of these types of services. Um, and we saw it grow slowly, there was a spurt of growth in 2018, which we nearly lost control of. We managed to control it back in because the industry in itself 
uh, needs to be taken, let's say, with a bit of a, um, a risk-based approach where you can't be a jurisdiction open to anyone and anything, um, uh, whatever, whatever the operator wants to do. So we had the framework, we had parameters, and we had criticized at the time the Maltese regulator because these parameters were very strict. So in order to set up an operation in Malta, amongst various requirements, there was prudential supervision, compliance, anti-money laundering checks, uh, substance, and these remained. And in fact, we did not go beyond the 20 operators of virtual financial assets over the years. However, what happened, was, which was interesting, is that the EU then came up with its own framework, which, we refer, which is called MICA for short. Uh, and MICA, when it was issued, uh, I mean, I'm no uh, big expert in digital asset law uh, or anything to do with digital assets, but I, for my interest, I was reading through this MICA and I found it a bit strange the first time I reviewed it, that it was very similar to, this, to our VFA Act. And in fact, then I was told that ultimately what MICA had done was, again, draw inspiration from the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive and basically um, replicated parts of it, not all, in this new legislation, which placed us in a, in a fantastic position because at the time that MICA was introduced, it, we, we hardly had to change anything in our legislation. Not only that, but our regulator had gained experience over a period of six years prior to the coming into force of MICA in dealing with financial, virtual financial asset service providers. Uh, to the extent that over the, the, the last few years, the MFSA actually invested and set up a fintech group, uh, which deals amongst others with MICA application or VFA applications, but anything also, anything to do uh, with, with financial technology. So the investment in this area by the jurisdiction was, was, was very heavy. There was a very heavy investment as well on the education inside. So today, um, anyone wanting to consider, and Malta is being considered and has been considered and used by the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. Um, uh, we were selective there though, we did not accept everyone. And we managed to wriggle out of um, uh, not uh, pushing away certain undesirables. So we, we were very careful in the approach that we took. Uh, however, anyone wanting to consider the jurisdiction is today able to deal with people at the regulator, people at an administrative level, people within the law firms, people within the audit firms. There's a whole ecosystem of experience. And I, my, my last point, one of the biggest criticisms that I remember being thrown at us in 2010 and 2012 was, we love you. You're a small jurisdiction, very sweet, but you're not experienced. We've been dealing with other jurisdictions. They've been doing this for the last 30 years. What experience do you have in this area? Now, that is a thing of the past in all areas because the ecosystem has grown so much that the experience and the investment in education, which happened locally, is second to none. But specifically in the area of digital assets or virtual financial assets, I think it's not just second to none. I, to, I think it is uh, at, a, at a level which is superior to what you will find in most of the, of the jurisdictions, even the mainstream, the bigger jurisdictions in the EU. Thank you. Chris, you've been leading an AFIM and USITS management company for some years now. Some managers, rather than setting up their own company, as we referred to earlier, prefer to work with established platforms, regulatory hosting solutions, from your end, because I know you do this, from your end, what would be the reasons that one would go for this option and what would be the advantages of opting for such solution? Um, so, yes, Annabelle, I mean, this is, this is our, let's say, core, uh, core business because uh, apart from being asset manager ourselves, we also host a number of wealth managers, um, uh, private, uh, let's say, managers and also, and also family offices in, in, our, in our platform. Um, uh, now, I mean, why uh, this um, this happens? I, I, I believe there are a number of 
of factors, um, and, and this uh, partly ties to what I said earlier. Um, of course, if managers are to uh, set up their own, uh, let's say, license and, and structure in Malta, and then subsequently their, uh, their schemes, of course, there is an initial capital to be done, right? Um, an initial in investment. And uh, for small managers or medium-sized managers, uh, that, that investment uh, might um, uh, might be sizable at the, be at the beginning. So um, what they would do, they would plug in into an established platform or, or an, uh, let's say, we call it a white label uh, platform. And in fact, AQA um, has been hosting um, an, a number of, of managers here. So I would say um, uh, the first is, uh, let's say, reduce initial initial capital, right? Because ultimately, you don't need to set up your own manager. You just plug in um, into an existing scheme. And that, uh, let's say, management company would delegate then the investment management function to the manager outside, outside uh, Malta. Now, I would say um, operational efficiency. I mean, uh, AQA and other uh, management companies in, in Malta have invested, uh, let's say, heavily in its operation infrastructure. So we are able to uh, do all the back of the back office work. Uh, we will do also the risk management, the, the compliance, the regulatory reporting, So, uh, which, which in itself is also um, a cost and it's, it's time consuming. So it will, uh, let's say, um, push the investment manager away from the uh, main business, the investment management or the portfolio management, and doing all these administrative tasks. So by also, uh, let's say, plugging into an established platform, uh, all, all these are taken care of by, um, uh, by the service providers within the, within the, the platform. Um, I would say also um, uh, scalability. Um, actually, before scalability, market market reach, because uh, ultimately, I mean, AQA has been in existing in for ten years now, um, and and of course, during the ten years with with our relationships uh, both locally and and also um, overseas, we have uh, established a number of uh, relationships, connex, connections, networks with a number of uh, institutional investors, um, uh, distributors, and and other market market participants, which um, uh, would also be. Beneficial beneficial or would also allow these prospective managers that, uh, let's say, plug in into uh, established schemes to uh, raise capital, for example, uh, distribute their funds across uh, across uh, Europe and also, um, uh, let's say, outside outside Europe. And so, so um, this could also be, um, uh, let's say, beneficial to the to the managers. And uh, before I mention scalability, I mean, scalability, I mean, now AQA, manages and administers over uh, 50, 50 funds across, uh, let's say, all, all the jurisdictions. So for us, launching a new, a new fund, um, uh, ensuring time to, to market, uh, because of course we are we are well connected on, on the island and also um, overseas. So this will ensure um, uh, scalability and economies of scale when um, when approaching, uh, let's say, service providers, market participants, the regulator. So that that can also be uh, beneficial. So. I mean, the main the main advantage to wrap it all is is of course I mean uh, the, the regulatory burden, um, uh, market reach, and and all is shifted onto the platform or to the to the AFM, and of course the the manager can focus. Exactly. So that's really good. All the relationships are in place, so you do not need to explore who to speak to when it comes to audits, um, fund administrators, custodians. So everything is in place. Fees probably negotiated at CCAV level, so definitely time to market will be the, the best advantage as well. Steve, um, when it comes to fund administration, the role of the fund administrator has evolved. I remember the time when we used to only process the NAV for the fund. Since then, regulatory reporting increased, um, compliance expectations increased, so we started all taking on compliance roles, MLRO roles. Um, can you discuss in more detail the role of the administrator and how the local ecosystem supports this and also the trends that we're seeing, um, technology changed, um, reporting requirements changed. So can you give us more detail yes, about um, this? Definitely. Um, obviously, I mean, as you, as you said, from when I started fund accounting, um, things have changed, changed a lot. Um, uh, we see that um, small to medium sized um, managers um, uh, are deciding to outsource the majority 
um, of the, the back, office, back office function to third party administrators because they obviously, and uh, I understand, they would like to focus more on the investment um, activities. Um, as we are all aware, funds um, are nowadays are subject to, to strict, um, much stricter AML requirements. Um, uh, and obviously, now that these AML requirements are in place um, uh, from a risk-based approach, um, more work needs to be done um, uh, from an AML standpoint. So we're talking about client risk assessments, um, uh, understanding who the investor is, source of wealth, source of funds. And unfortunately, when um, investors come to the fund administrator to start the, invest the, the subscription um, process, they and many times we see that investors um, complain um, because we are asking for uh, too much documents, we are asking for um, a source of wealth and source of funds. So um, uh, in recent years, we are trying to simplify and to streamline the process um, uh, for subscriptions and redemptions and uh, investing um, in creating uh, investor portals um, which are linked to our systems where investors can um, upload the documents and um, they can um, uh, fill in the information online and the CRA then is, is um, generally automated um, for us to see um, what documents are required from the particular investor. So yes, um, things have changed a lot, changed a lot in that area. Um, uh, the, as you mentioned, uh, the majority, um, not all, but the majority of the fund administrators in Malta um, also offer uh, MLRO and compliance roles. Um, uh, and um, these are, are usually um, subject to, to um, uh, SLAs um, in order to make sure that um, escalation to the board or to the shareholders of the fund um, is done efficiently, um, but obviously um, following strict procedures. So I think this is something that um, has changed a lot during the years. Um, having um, uh, MLRO and compliance roles, as we know, um, is very sensitive, um, uh, very um, time consuming too, um, but um, as fund administrators in Malta, we recognize the need um, uh, from the investment managers that we also, um, in some cases, need to handle also these, these roads. Um, uh, other things that I would like to mention is in relation to regulatory, rep regulatory reporting. Um, uh, in the past, um, uh, we were not involved uh, as such in all the type of reporting, but nowadays, um, the majority of fund administrators in Malta offer um, uh, the preparation of financial statements, obviously analyzing with the auditors. Um, we also do VAT um, work, um, a payroll work for the directors and submissions of the forms to the, um, to the tax departments in Malta, um, FATCA and CRS tax reporting, um, and also um, uh, European statistical returns that need to be um, um, uh, submitted um, to the central bank. Um, for example, just to give you an idea, um, uh, we and my company have managed to um, automate the, the, um, uh, the, fa the FATCA and CRS reporting, um, uh, but also um, the submission um, of these sub um, statistical returns can also be automated and therefore um, we managed to obviously um, control the costs because we understand that um, having a fund in Malta, starting a fund in Malta, and we see many funds which have low AUMs. So um, uh, we, we have funds that can start um, between 10 and 20 million, and they come to Malta um, to build that track record, and then when that track record is built, they usually remain in Malta and grow the fund in Malta, and that is something that we are, we are very proud of, that we can also manage small funds and that they, they can actually survive in Malta. So we had real stories there which um, show what we can we, what we can offer um, uh, obviously from an investor standpoint um, uh, investors are demanding for greater and transparency and also more details uh, more details in the reporting um, uh, and also the transfer transfer agency and uh, they would like to see more information about the fund performance but also about the risk associated with the portfolio um, uh, and uh, and the liquidity of, of the fund so these are other functionalities and other attributes which we are trying to include in our service in order to, as I said before, offer um, a one-stop shop um, in Malta. Um, uh, we also see um, uh, from a reporting standpoint that many managers and also investors would like um, to have 
um, reports in a certain layout or in a certain format. Okay, um, so um, this is something we have also worked in, and I know that all service, all services provi service providers and more have worked on in the past, um, where we are able to actually sit down with the client, with our system providers, and develop a report which fits per perfectly also in their system, because many managers um, uh, would like to mirror the NAV in order to be able to, to do also their checks. And I think um, uh, this is something uh, very important, and we see that our clients appreciate that we are able to do so. Um, uh, I don't know if someone want to mention. Um, uh, something else in relation to reporting, especially now with digital assets, we're seeing um, that the frequency of trading also has increased, and the frequency has also increased. Um, so we are also able to plug in um, uh, the broker into the broker system or uh, receive files from the broker via SWIFT or CSV or APIs. Um, and in that way, um, we are manage, managing to optimize and to also um, reduce the manual intervention needed for us to um, uh, calculate and issue the NAV on, on sort of a preset um, evaluation frequency. Thanks. Um, so it's obvious that as a fund administrator, you end up a little bit the point of contact of exactly. everyone. So the, the reference of, of the manager in Malta across different service providers. Chris, quickly. Um, we. we heard um, even Steve, uh, you know, descri describing the role of the fund administrator. You spoke earlier how you can assist fund managers. How strong are, how important are strong partnerships with, with the, all the service providers um, servicing the fund? The answer is definitely yes. I mean, uh, the the relationship between uh, all 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 the service providers um, is 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 actually important, of course, to um, to the ecosystem of the, let's say the asset management ecosystem in um, in, in in Malta. Um, of course, um, uh, the regulator also um, uh, participates in in this and and in every let's say um, event that we go or in in every client meeting that we that we have. I um, uh, I do believe and I do stress this that one of our strong points as a jurisdiction is the regulator um, because I, I have yet to see operating in uh, in many jurisdiction um, that uh, the regulator um, is, is uh, open his doors um, at all let's say levels um, of um, uh, of the uh, let's say project of the manager, be it a, or, or a fund, because ultimately the um, uh, the MFSA uh, holds initial meetings and also uh, then holds ongoing meeting with um, uh, with with uh, let's say the prospective managers, the um, uh, the CCAVs, etc. So that is I would say that is one of our strong points. And then Annabel to to tie this, um, uh, let's say the. Uh, partnership between the service providers and the jurisdiction, it also then um, contributes to two main factors, I would say. One is the knowledge and experience. We all said here um, that, uh, that of course, um, uh, I mean, uh, senior management um, is involved in the actual uh, decisions and meeting with clients, but also um, I, I genuinely believe, uh, again, having uh, exposure to different um, uh, jurisdiction, I do believe that um, uh, collectively, um, as um, service providers, we we have the necessary expertise and the, the regulatory knowledge um, to do to do well. And um, uh, the the last point is is on pricing. You mentioned earlier. Um, I do believe that for the the quality of service that we that we provide, we are very competitive. We're not the cheapest. So here I'm not saying that we are the cheapest. And I do genuinely believe that Malta does not want to be the cheapest. Uh, but for the quality that we um, that we provide compared to to others, I genuinely believe that um, we do offer competitive price. Thank you, um, Andre. Before we go to the last question, um, when it comes to taxation, taxation always comes up. Can we briefly just um, give a basic overview of how funds are impacted when it comes to tax and investors? I think again the the fiscal policy I think was was uh, adopted by the by the the country on taxation of funds is pretty much in line mm -hmm. with that which we with, with the one which we see internationally in that it is not uh, in the interest of the Maltese revenue or the Maltese tax authorities to actually tax the fund unless the fund is investing in Malta so in Maltese assets in which case there are obviously certain carve-outs. 
nor was it, is it in the interest of the Maltese revenue to tax investors in the fund to the extent that those investors do not live, do not reside in Malta. Um, so, uh, keeping it very brief, although uh, collective investment schemes are subject persons from a tax point of view, so they need to file a tax return, so they are on the radar of the tax authority. However, to the extent that that collective investment scheme is not making any local investments, nor is it attracting any local investors, there is no tax at the level of the scheme, nor is there any tax at the level of the investor. Very good. Last question, Claire. Um, as an authority, you're always working on new frameworks, innovations. Um, uh, can you tell us more about what you're currently working on and what we should expect in the near and future? Well, we mentioned quite a lot um, the, uh, the notified PIF. Um, first of all, I mean, the ongoing work, again, is on three fronts from an MFSA point of view. So it's policy development, um, uh, and industry outreach, and process enhancements, because um, obviously they need to be seen in parallel with the, I mean, in relation to the ongoing efforts. Um, with regards to the notified PIF structure, um, we, are, we have practically, um, we are now in the process of um, enhancing the framework even further to allow um, the structure to be internally managed as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we launched the framework um, having the possibility to appoint an EEA manager or a third country manager in relation to, to the notified PIF structure. Um, and now we will also be allowing um, notified PIFs to be internally managed, which then would be um, the equivalent of, of, of the minimis haven. Um, so work is also um, ongoing on, on that front, which should also um, provide um, small, um, medium-sized fund managers to um, have a quicker even time to market. And more proportionate, um, especially even onboarding related requirements. Um, uh, we are also in the process of um, uh, launching um, uh, an additional uh, legal structure available um, for our fund frameworks, which is the special um, limited um, partnership framework as well, which is quite well advanced and um, close to implementation now. Um, in Malta, um, we already have um, a limited partnership um, possibility um, for our funds, um, but it has legal separate separate legal personality. Um, uh, and in this context, um, we are um, uh, practically after achieving a structure which from research that we had done and from industry also engagement, um, asset managers are more familiar with um, using, and especially in the context of even um, private equity funds, for example. Um, the formation will be entirely administered by the MFSA. Um, uh, it will be constituted um, similarly via a partnership agreement, indeed, and there will be obviously then differences um, on the on the liability side. Um, we should be hopefully seeing um, this framework uh, being launched over the next few weeks. Um, with regards to the register the minimis framework, mm -hmm. in order to also align it even more um, uh, to the needs of again um, small fund managers and closer um, to what the alternative investment fund managers directive um, stipulates, we are in the process of revising um, the the minimis framework. Currently, the MFSA um, licenses um, uh, reg oh, sorry um, registered um, uh, small fund managers, and now we will be seeing also a more streamlined process applicable to these type of applications as well. Um, uh, besides the, uh, the small fund, the, the registered fund managers framework, um, there is also work um, in relation to um, family offices. Um, practically, we're seeing that high net worth individuals and ultra high net worth individuals are increasingly um, uh, setting up family offices. Um, uh, and Malta having a robust um, regulatory um, legal framework together with, um, we've been mentioning as well, the taxation aspects offering a compelling, um, uh, this, I mean, why to, 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 to opt for Malta as a jurisdiction of choice in this regard. And the MFSA is um, uh, working closely with the uh, Malta Financial Services Advisory Council, which is um, the council responsible for the uh, national strategy for financial services in Malta, which I believe um, is an important component that hasn't been mentioned so far, um, in order to come up and facilitate um, uh, the setup of, of uh, these structures in Malta, which will entail both regulated and unregulated um, components. 
Um, on the process enhancement front, um, there is a huge um, uh, digitization project um, ongoing, which will um, uh, has kicked off earlier on this year at the MFSA to um, enhance even further and digitize the, the processes. Um, uh, so we hope to see even a positive impact um, both on the authorization side and supervision and point of view. Um, we are also affecting process enhancements in relation to our, uh, when it comes to data architecture, implementation of technology. So all, I mean, that is also ongoing. Um, uh, and last but, but not least, I have also mentioned the um, MFSA Council. Um, the MFSA is working closely um, with, 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 with other institutions and with other authorities. Um, and industry practitioners to address um, overarching topics, which are hot topics, um, such as reducing bureaucracy, um, uh, uh, the application of reporting. Um, so the authorities also, um, in parallel, working closely um, uh, with, with, with other authorities to implement these initiatives as well. Very good. A lot going on.